All right, good morning, Rescue House. How are we doing? Hey. Wow, it's just so good to be back. I missed you so much. Uh, it's been a great time with my family, um, investing in my kids, all three of them, and my marriage over the last four weeks. Uh, but I couldn't be more excited uh, to be with you starting a brand new series today that I really believe that if this series, if this word even today will just get inside of you, you know, it won't just be kind of head knowledge, it won't just be kind of like, you know, in, in my head, but if I can get it in your heart, if I can get it moving inside of you, there's going to be something that shifts in your soul. So I'm, I'm super excited today. I literally could go bear hunting with a switch right now. That's how excited I am. Anybody want to go with me? Anybody? Not even the Shelton family. All right. Uh, hey, I do want to welcome those that are watching online, especially our Rescue House North family this morning. They served my favorite Pop-Tarts to their family in honor of me. That was pretty cool. Uh, you know, don't really get a lot of honors, but the Pop-Tarts are good. Uh, we love you, Rescue House North. Can we give our Massachusetts campus a round of applause? <laughs> We are so excited to have you and those that are watching online. Hey, it was a really cool experience this coming Wednesday. We've got 61 students and leaders going to get in the presence of God. They're going to Crowder's Ridge Camp. Yeah, you can clap for that. Um, and we want to be a church that prays for them. You know, we say all the time, we don't have a student ministry we are a student ministry. And what that means is, you know, it's not just these are the, you know, the generation of tomorrow. No, they're the generation of today. And we are currently right now passing the baton of the gospel and the church off to them. We're raising up leaders and we are praying for them. And we want to make sure that we're doing that all week long. So in your seat, I want everybody to get your card out. Your card has a unique name on it. And this is the person that we're asking you uh, this student to pray for them all week. They leave on Wednesday and they'll return next Sunday. But we want you to go ahead and begin to commit to praying for them for the next seven days. And I know you may not even know who they are, but God knows who they are. I mean, they're going to have opportunities to get into the presence of God, get away from the world and really hear from God. And so you say, well, what, what do I need to be praying for? You need to be praying that they hear from the Lord. Uh, on their level, because it's, it needs to be a faith of their own. It needs to be a decision on their own. Many of our students are already saved. Uh, many of them are baptized, but I, I believe that we want to see them embrace who God made them to be. Can I get an amen, right? Like, this life is not about just getting saved and baptized. That's part of it. That's the start of the journey, but we really want our students to understand that God has a great calling on their life, a great destiny, a great purpose, and you are not too young to begin to embrace all that God has for you. It's not something like, oh, when I get out of college, I'll tend to what God has for me. No, you go ahead and begin to do that uh, today. And so if you would, I would love to just have any students that are going to camp or student leaders, if you would just stand up, I would like to have a moment of prayer just to pray for you uh, right now, as well as, as you have this in your hand, we'll pray over your student name as well. And if you kind of just feel comfortable, if you, you know, you just want to reach a hand out uh, towards somebody that is going to camp, a student leader, uh, let's pray to together that they would encounter the living God. Can I get a good amen, somebody? Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these students. We thank you for these leaders who are going to go and just kind of get away from the world and into the presence of God. And God, I know that uh, you want to have a moment with each one of them. And I don't know what that moment looks like, but I ask uh, that they would just be obedient to whatever you would speak into their lives. Um, God, I pray that they would have a true encounter with you, that they wouldn't just have a fun week at camp. I pray that it is fun. I pray that it is a blast. But God, I pray more than anything that they would just hear from you and that you would speak to them and that they would uh, have the faith to receive all that you have for them. God, I pray that you would call some of them into ministry. I pray that you would call some of them to be saved, some of them to take the next step in baptism, some of them to uh, take the next step in their calling, their purpose, and their destiny. God, I pray that they would go ahead and begin to embrace who you made them to be, that you created them in, the, in your image for a unique purpose on purpose and for a purpose, and I pray, God, just that the, the Holy Spirit would abound on that camp, that the enemy would have no place there, that we would rebuke the enemy, we, we kick him out, we snuff him out, and we just say, Holy Spirit, take over that camp, uh, every nook and cranny of it, from the place that they sleep, to the dining hall, to the place of worship, 
to their recreation, to the fun stuff. God, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would be in it and consume it and you would rest on Crowder's Ridge this weekend. And so we ask that you would protect our students' hearts, their minds, and God, that you would go ahead and prepare their hearts right now for what they're gonna hear from you this weekend. We pray for a God moment for every student. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. One time, let's give it up for our students. <clears throat> So like I said, today we start a brand new series that I'm excited about. I believe it's going to be a powerful day. Um, and what we're going to talk about <clears throat> really is the greatest power in the world. Today, I want to talk to you about the subject of faith. And the reality is where there is no faith, there is no power. And your faith, listen to me, will determine much of what you see from God your entire life. Your faith will determine what you receive from God. It is only through faith that we are able to experience and witness the invisible and witness the spiritual realm and the power that comes with that. And I just believe in our society, in our world today, that there has never been a more important time in history for the people of God to activate a vibrant, joy-filled, hope-filled faith. Because it's this type of faith that's going to show an unbelieving world that Christ makes a difference in our life. <clears throat> now, everybody has some type of faith, right? Like if you brushed your teeth this morning, you got some faith. You got faith that somehow you don't know where that water came from. You don't know how that water came through the pipes, and you don't know how that water was clean, but you just trust it, and you have faith, right? Anybody flown in the last six months? Anybody flown on a plane? You got some faith. You, have no, you didn't even know the name of your pilot. You didn't know what school he went to. You had no idea if he even knew how to operate that thing. You don't know how the wings, you know, make the aerodynamics of the plane go. You just got on the plane and you just had faith that everything was going to be okay. But, but everybody has that type of faith. But the faith I'm talking about is a supernatural faith in the things that we cannot see in this world. And so as I talk about faith from this point out, I'm talking about the faith, the spiritual faith that God gives. And it is a gift from God. And this type of faith, the supernatural spiritual faith, is essential to the Christian life. I don't know if you know this or not, but you can't even get saved without this supernatural faith. Ephesians 2, 8 says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. Again, it is a gift of God. So you cannot even get saved without this type of faith. You won't see miracles without this type of faith. Jesus went to his hometown in Matthew chapter 13, and here's what it says. This is a place where Jesus, more than any other place, would want to do uh, miracles, would want to heal his friends, the people that he grew up with. It reminds me of God's call on my life to come back to my hometown. Like, I, like, again, when you're growing up in Davie County, sometimes as a young person, you're like, I can't wait to get out. And then you get out and you're like, man, I have such a heart for that place and heart for my teachers and my principals and, and the people that, you know, help me and, and my friends who are unsaved. And, and, and I just, I know Jesus' heart here. He wanted to do miracles in this place more than any other. But here it says in verse 58, and he did not not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. And the reality is if you're not living with a vibrant, active faith, you will miss much of what God is doing in our midst. In order to receive things from God, you must have faith. And all of these things are available to you. I don't know if you've been walking with friends who are, you know, maybe you consider like, you know, maybe a little bit more spiritual than you. And oftentimes they're picking up things that you're not really picking up on. You're like, man, I, how did you see that? How did you feel that? How do you, how do you walk? And it's by faith. Did anybody's maybe parents in here have one of those satellite systems back in the 80s where it was like gigantic and it took up like a quarter of the yard, right? like a quarter acre, and it's like, man, you, you know, they were like cutting edge, like they were, you know, had this big, my, the babysitter that I grew up in, 
They had one, and I'd never seen one before, and this thing was like massive, like something you see out of NASA. You know, that was just to get cable back, or, you know, satellite. And uh, I just remember, like, it was picking up what was there all along, but the neighbors, they couldn't pick up what that was picking up because they didn't have the satellite. And I just wonder how many of you aren't picking up what your neighbor's picking up because you don't have the satellite of faith. The faith is the receiver that picks up what God is already doing. It's just some of us can receive it and some of us can't, and it is determined by faith. You gotta have this faith because I'm telling you, it picks up joy. It picks up blessing, picks up peace, picks up salvation. And a lot of times these people are standing right next to you And it's like, man, why are they receiving this? Why are they in this state? And and it's because of faith. Some blind guys came to Jesus one time in Matthew chapter nine, believing in faith that they would be healed. It says in verse 29, then Jesus touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open. And so our faith will determine what we receive from God and experience from God. Because if you don't believe that he will, then he's not going to do it. If you won't ask him or you ask him in a faithless way that kind of begs him not to even really answer the prayer, then he won't. And you won't pick up what he is dropping I did come to tell you this. If there's one thing that the devil wants to attack in your life, it's your faith. It's your number one commodity that you possess, that and the Holy Spirit. It's the most valuable commodity that you have. And some people say, well, the devil's attacking my marriage. The devil's attacking my place of work. My, you know, the devil's attacking my finances. No, what he's really attacking is your faith in God. You say, well, why would he attack my faith? Because it's faith that moves mountains. It's faith that stirs heaven. It's faith that gives me courage. It's faith that gives me boldness. It's faith that leads to healing. It's faith that gives me confidence. It's our faith that makes a massive different and moves the heart of God and cast out diseases and demons and connects you with the spirit it allows you to forgive when you don't really want to forgive I'm telling you your faith is the most important thing you have and it's our faith man I've experienced this so many times over my 15 years in ministry it's your faith that gives you the tenacity to keep going to not give up, to keep believing. When everything in the world is pressing against you and everything on the inside is telling you to give up, faith tells you do not give up. Keep going. Put one foot in front of the other. God is with you. God is for you. He will not leave you forsaken. He's God Emmanuel, God with us. Keep going. That's what faith does. God is faithful And he honors audacious faith because faith honors God. Paul understood this when he went to Thessalonica. And in my quiet time over the last couple of weeks, I've spent a lot of time in Thessalonians. And as I would read through that and highlight that, one of the things that really stuck out to me was what Paul was really concerned with with the church in Thessalonica. In other words, this is a place where in northern Greece where Paul went and he planted this church in about a month's time and then he established leadership and then he went to go plant another church but he would write back to them. He would send Timothy, his protege, to check on the church in Thessalonica and when he sent Timothy, he wasn't sending Timothy to check on, hey, have they gotten a lot of lights put up in the auditorium right now? Hey, can you, can you check and see if they've got the parking lot paved? Hey, check and see if they got the, the, the most legit worship band. That's not what Paul was sending Timothy to check out. Check out what Paul was most concerned about with the church that he planted in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, we sent Timothy, who is our brother, our God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ. Here it is, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. 
Verse five, for this reason, when we could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. <clears throat> Verse six, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and brought us good news about your faith. Why? Because when your faith is weak, you are weak. A f- your, where your faith is, is is a great measuring stick to wh- how well you're doing in your relationship with Christ. Verse seven, therefore, brothers, in all of your distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. And then verse 10, he says it again. Night and day, we pray most earnestly that you may see, we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. All that to say that the condition of your faith may be the most important thing about your walk with Christ. How much faith do you have? With that in mind, in this first installment of our series, Faithful, I just want to answer three basic questions for you to lay a foundation for the rest of our time together over the next five or six weeks. So starting with question number one, what is faith? The best definition of faith undoubtedly is found in Hebrews 11, chapter 1. It says this, now faith is, so so notice that right there, faith is. It's not faith was, faith is going to be. No, faith is, it's present time right here. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So what is faith? Letter A, faith is confidence. It's confidence, I got this chair right here on stage, and again, I don't know who put this thing together. I don't know what make or model this chair is. I I know very, very little about this chair, but I've got the confidence that when I sit down in this chair, I'm going to be all right, that it's going to hold me up, that it's going to be okay. And here's the reality is, I know less about this chair than I do about what God has revealed in his word. And yet I've got more confidence sometimes, if I'm being real and vulnerable, more confidence in the chair than I do with what God has already revealed to me in his word over and over again. And and the point is, the more you walk with God, the more you get inside of God's word, the more God's word gets inside of you, the more you are in his presence, the more confident you are in the things of God and in the word of God. And then what happens is your faith gives you confidence about the things you are hoping for. So no longer, this is not like a a hope in like, I wish this happens. You're going through something. You're going through the valley of the shadow of death. You're going through a circumstance or situation. And it's no longer, man, I hope this is the outcome. It's, I know this is the outcome because God is for me and God is with me and he has revealed to me in his word. And so I have a confidence in a God who comes through for me. So faith is confidence. Letter B, faith is conviction. Those are the two things. It's confidence and conviction. Hebrews 11, one says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And here it is, the conviction of things not seen. When we talk about conviction, we aren't talking about preferences. I prefer this or I prefer that. A conviction is this is part of my soul. This is like deep down inside of my being. Faith is on the inside and I hold on to it internally. It's something that I know that I know that I know and you can't take it away from me. You can't talk me out of it because it's an assurance and then it's a conviction and it lives in my soul and it, this conviction and this faith guides me in my life. Now, if we're being honest today, I don't want to just skip over the fact that in every believer, yes, faith lives in our soul, but it doesn't live alone. There's a whole community living down in your soul around your faith. 
So I don't care how faith-filled you are, your faith is not holding down the block by itself. In other words, inside of you, there is some doubt. Doubt lives in the neighborhood. Fear lives in the neighborhood. Three doors down, worry lives in the neighborhood. Down the corner, anxiety's hanging out. Depression lives in a small apartment above the garage. And all of them are in your inner being. And so you've got faith, but then around in the cul-de-sac, you've got fear, you've got anxiety, you've got worry, and, and you're juggling all this. And some people try to act like, you know, they don't have any fear, they don't have any doubt. And it's like everybody at some point, to some degree, has some fear, has some doubt. All of this stuff, again, lives in the neighborhood, and it depends on what you watch and what you allow in your ears, in your soul, through your eyes, that determines what's going to rise to the top. Is fear going to rise to the top today, or is depression going to rise to the top, or is faith? And that's why here at Rescue House, I mean, we want to not just feed you the Word of God, we want to teach you how to study the Word of God, because the more you get into the Word of God, the more faith becomes the dominant and prominent thing in the neighborhood, and while all these circumstances and situations can happen, fear, anxiety comes, but I'm holding ground to the Word of God, the most precious thing I'll ever hold in my hands, and I allow it into my life, and and faith rises above all of that in spite of the circumstances and situations so that I've got some convictions. I've got some assurances in the spite of what I see. Faith is the assurance and conviction of the things I can't see. Like I have, a, I have assurance and conviction today that the word of God is alive and active and that it cuts through, I mean it's sharper than any two-edged sword, cuts through bone and marrow and it reveals to us areas where we need to get better and encourages us in areas that we are winning. I'm convicted that the word of God is like a mirror that you can look at and see your reflection and see where you can get better and see how you can make much more of Christ. I'm convicted that there is power in prayer. This is the year of prayer at Rescue House Church. And we deem to that because we have a conviction that when you get a bunch of people together, especially righteous people, because the prayer of a righteous person is affected. When you get some righteous people together who are obedient to God's word and they're praying and they're two or three or, or, or agree on anything, it is done. I'm convicted of that. I believe it stirs the unseen when we pray together. I'm convicted that when I give, God blesses me. And it's not like I give him a dollar and he gives me $10 back. But I, when I give to him and I give in this church and I give outside the church, and when, if I'm a giver and I'm generous, then he's going to bless my life. I know that I know that I know that. I'm convicted of that. I'm convicted that God saves people, even though I've never physically seen the heart transformation with my own eyes. I've seen evidence of it. But I'm convicted and convinced of that. And I know that I know that I know that there is an eternal life after this one. And it is a place called heaven. And Jesus will be there. And I will spend eternity with him, worshiping him forever and ever and ever. It's faith. It's assurance. It's conviction. And so what is faith? It's confidence and conviction, and I want you to have more of it. And I believe God is calling us to more faith. The second question of the day after what is faith is why is faith important? Why is this even important? Why are we gonna spend five or six weeks even talking about this? Letter A, because faith pleases God. Faith pleases God. The heart of God. He loves it. It makes him proud. It makes him smile when we step out in faith, when we quite don't understand the whole plan, when we can't see the end goal, but we say, we've heard from you, God. I've read in your word, or I've had an impression, and I know that I'm supposed to do this, and you step out in faith, man, that nothing makes God smile more than that. And so it pleases 
God. Hebrews 11, 2 says this, for by it, the people of old, so for by faith, the people of old receive their commendation. Same verse in the NIV says it like this. This is what the ancients were commended for. What were they commended for? They were commended for doing work by faith. Your homework this week is to read all of Hebrews chapter 11. Write that down so you don't forget it. Just this week, I just want you to study Hebrews chapter 11. This is known in the Bible as the biblical hall of faith. And as you read it this week, you'll see it is by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Isaac, and it shares their stories. I'll share one with you right here. It's in verse eight. It's Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham, who called to go to a place, or when called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So what's the lesson here? He couldn't see where he was going. He didn't know where he was going, but he knew God was calling him. Therefore he went. He didn't have all, the, uh, all of it planned out. This is the life of faith. It's being sure of what we hope for. What's he hoping for? His own land. And he is certain of something that he cannot See, it goes on to say, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in the foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. Again, he couldn't see it, but he was certain of it. A life of faith is not going to play out with you knowing all the details. That's not how God works. He's not gonna give you every step and then show you the end goal and then say go. And I'm just telling you, if you're one of those people that you have to have it all figured out, that you have to know every step, you have to know the entire plan, you have to see how it's gonna work out, if that's you, you're never gonna be able to walk by faith. And you're never gonna be positioned like that receiver to receive all that God has for you. Come on, sometimes you gotta step out of the boat. If you know for sure that God is calling you to do something, you got to step out. Hebrews eleven twenty four. by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasure of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Could he see the reward? No, but he was certain of something that he couldn't. See, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. How do you see the invisible? How do you see what other people can't see? What the world cannot see? How do you do it? By faith. Faith hears the inaudible. It sees the invisible. That's why it does the impossible. Like, when you go to work as a Christian, don't expect your coworkers to hear what you're hearing. Don't expect them to see what you're seeing. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And if you're in here, they're like, that's like a little bit weird, and I just don't feel like I can get handles on that, and I just seem like blind faith. Well, you're never going to really be able to walk by faith. And you're not walking by faith, but it is faith that fuels the power of God in our lives. And the more you walk in faith, the more you're obedient to God, the more he builds that faith and the more confidence and assurance you have. Again, if you have to question everything and have an answer for everything before you step out, you're not going to walk by faith. And most Christians won't step out in faith because they don't know how it's going to end or they don't know what the next step, three or four steps are. And I just want you to know, I believe God is calling all of us, Rescue House North, Rescue House Moxville, those that are watching online, he is calling all of us to a new level of faith. A faith not in what we can see, but a faith in what is invisible, what is inaudible to the world. 
And you will get to experience miracles and the impossible if you walk by faith. Romans 4 verse 3 says, For the scripture tells us Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Everything goes back to this foundation of faith. Hebrews 11:6 6 says this, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. God. So I told you, faith is what really pleases the heart of God. Without it, it's impossible to please God. The second reason our faith is important, letter B, is because faith gives us insight into how God works. Faith gives us insight and understanding to the ways of God that the world cannot understand. Verse 3, Hebrews 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand. So there's an understanding of the way that God works and the things of God and the things that God wants to do when it comes to a person walking by faith. And a person that isn't walking by faith or who lacks faith forfeits that understanding of God. Call it, if you will, a sixth sense. I sense what God is doing in a place. I sense the presence of God in this place. I sense his voice. I sense an impression. And don't make the mistake of limiting this just to an hour on Sunday morning church. I'm talking about this type of faith that I'm talking about is a Monday morning faith. It's a Saturday afternoon faith. It's a Thursday evening faith. It's a, it's a 24-7, 365 days a year type faith where I'm sensing the Lord and I'm walking by faith as the Holy Spirit leads and guides me and if you're not walking by that type of faith then you'll never have the confidence to step out into what God is doing you'll just kind of work a dead-end job paycheck to paycheck just live and drudge through life and it is what it is and you'll be a Christian and you'll go to heaven but you'll never receive all that God has for you I think about times where I'm just in the grocery store and I, I'll see somebody that I maybe vaguely know, maybe an acquaintance, or maybe it's even somebody that I don't quite know, but I know of them. They maybe know of me. And the Lord impresses it upon my heart to go pray for them right there in the middle of the grocery store. Now, can I just be honest with you? My flesh, I don't want to do that. Like, that's a look, like, they're trying to grocery shop. They're trying to do their thing. Like, they, the last thing they want is some, you know, weirdo preacher coming up to them and like, hey, I need to pray for you, you know? But I'm going to tell you what. Every time I felt the impression and the voice of the Lord to say, go do something like that, every time, 100%, this is not preacher talk. This is not pastor talk. Every time I've done it, I've been so glad that I did. I've never not once regretted being obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit in that moment and the prompting of my faith. But I'll tell you what, there have been times where God's told me to do it and I've kind of chickened out and I've been like, you know, like they're gonna think I'm weird, like they don't want that, like, and I just kind of back out of it. I still think about those times today and I can almost name every single one of those times to you. And so what, what, as you activate your faith, as you get joy-filled faith, you, you get this faith that honestly, in those types of moments when God tells you to do something that might be outside the box, might be a little bit weird, whatever, that faith gives you power to not care about what somebody thinks about you and gives you power to want to please God and to allow faith to rise in your heart. Here's the example that he gives, he says, by faith we understand, so there's an understanding that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. The writer's point here is that faith helps us understand what we cannot see, that was something that we could not know any other way. And the creation of the world is something that only you and I can know by faith. Like, like, we can't say, oh, well, I was there in the beginning when that happened. <laughs> the creation of the world is so vast, like not even science can understand. Even though it tries. We have problems 
as a world and even as Christians accepting what we can see because it's so big. Does anybody know about the Hubble telescope? Anybody? I think this thing is like fascinating. It brought back an image to us not long ago, a couple years ago, of a galactic collision of a thousand cluster of stars. This is where two galaxies, each with a cluster of a thousand stars, collide into one another. So you've got a cluster of a thousand stars over here, a thousand cluster of stars here. In each cluster is one million stars. So I've got a thousand clusters. In each cluster is a million stars. And then I've got a thousand star, a thousand cluster of stars. In each cluster of star is a million stars. And boom, it's just coming in for a collision. And what we can see. The Hubble telescope gave us an image of the home that we live in, the Milky Way galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy, there are estimated 100 billion stars. This is just one galaxy. Uh, and you're like in there somewhere. Like you're like, like, like a little blip on the screen. Like um, you're like, boop, you can't even like, you can't even like see. Like that's where we live. And this is just one galaxy. And in this galaxy, there are 100 billion stars. Did you know in the known universe, what we can see, what we know of, there are 100 million galaxies. There's 100 million of these things. Like, I don't know about you, but like, the, the faith in a God who created the earth is a thousand more times reasonable than a faith of accidental chain of events that just kind of launched all of this stuff. Einstein theorized that the unknown space was one billion times greater than known space. So what we can see is the hundred you know, million galaxies. That's what... And then the unknown space, what we cannot see, when it comes to the creation of the world, what the scripture is saying here is we accept it by faith. That's what he says in verse three. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Now, the universe there means everything. The physical universe, the known universe, the unknown, and it even encompasses heaven, hell, demons, angels, like all of the things that we cannot see. And I'm certain and confident in those things, just as I am confident that at the end of time, we will pass into eternity. The word universe there can be translated as ages. So before time, after time, in eternity, because God is outside of time and space. And I know that's a lot. And like your brain's probably like, whoa, what is going on here? And, but I'm telling you, that if you can't get a handle on that by faith, then what happens is you live a life, this is the tragedy when you don't have this type of faith, is you live a life, your entire life, fearing death and fearing that moment. And that's just sad. I know a lot of people, people in my family, people in my extended family, people in my, who they fear death so much that it keeps them from living and bringing heaven to earth now. And it's a tragedy. It's heartbreaking to watch. And so you must have this faith. Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed. I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but another word for that is framed. And it's just like he took, you know, before time, after time, and he just kind of put some handles on it and he just framed it out, even though there's stuff before and after. And he framed and formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was Visible. In other words, that God, out of nothing, created everything that you see today. He was the bang before the big bang. 
And I don't care if you believe in the Big Bang as long as you believe God did the Big Bang. I don't care how you believe he did it, but I believe and am certain and am confident that he did it in six days and rested on the seventh. And I believe all of that by faith. By faith. I want to close with this. How do I get faith? I mean, I hear you talking about, Pastor, about this faith and like, how do I, how do I get this type of faith? Like, I, I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. I want to have faith, but help me in my lack of faith. This is a really important question. Romans says that every man is given a measure of faith. So, so the moment that you get saved, even the moment before God has given you faith to get saved, and in that moment you are dealt a measure of faith. And now the question becomes, what do you do with that faith? There's a principle in the New Testament where Jesus says, to him who has more, more will be given. To him who does not have what he does have will be taken from him. If I could translate that for you, what he's talking about is a desire for more. And he's saying to the believer that if you desire more of something that is from God, God will give it to you. God will give you more. But if you don't desire more of what God has given to you, then actually what you have and what he gave you in the first place will actually be taken away from you. So here's how this works. It's like you hear the word of God. You hear a message like this today and you go, man, all right, God, you're stirring in my heart. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me and I want more faith. I want more of your word. I want more courage. I want more boldness. I want to be more obedient. God, I want more. And guess what? God will give you more. But if you're in here like, oh man, I just wish this thing would hurry up and end so I can just go get something to eat. Like I really don't like have much interest in it, and like I don't really get it, I can't get handlebars around it, and I'm just, you know, if you can just kind of hurry up and just get over this, then even what little faith you have will be taken away from you. And you say, well, how do I, how do I build this faith? Like, how do I, how does my neighbor who just seems to be in tune with God receiving as all the joy, all the peace in the midst of chaos, like how do they receive all of that? How do they build their faith? You gotta work your faith. I have a friend who's in my small group who's been a friend of mine for a very long time. He's about six, seven, and he is formerly a bodybuilder. I mean, if I could put this dude on stage, I mean, he's like, whoa, whoa. And when I put him beside of me and we've had this conversation, like he wasn't given any more muscle than I was at any point in time. In fact, we have the same exact muscle mass when we were babies. God gave, dealt us the same exact. He don't have more muscles than I did. Like he doesn't have different muscles. Like, you know what the difference is? He got in the gym and worked it out. He ate the right food, somebody. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. And he put the time and the effort into building his muscle. The same is true with you and your faith. You gotta put the time in, you gotta put the effort in, you gotta get in God's word. And, and listen to me, the things that God reveals to you in his word the, the revealable word of God, when you're obedient to those things, it builds your faith to eventually you start to be able to hear the unrevealed word of God. How do you think you will ever obey the unrevealed word of God if you cannot obey the revealed word of God? But the more you are obedient to this, to what God has revealed to you, then the more you start to hear things that other people aren't hearing, the more you start to be able to truly see things that other people aren't seeing, and you get to step out in faith, and God uses you at a maximum level to bring heaven to earth. This might be somebody's big takeaway right here. 
it is a very dangerous thing to say no to God. Not because he's going to be like out to get you, but because delayed obedience diminishes faith in your life. Delay keeps people from experiencing deliverance. That's why James 2, 17 says this. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, in other words, if you're not working it, if you're not acting by faith, stepping out on faith, it's really no faith at all. It's a dead faith. It's a faith that can't save you. And you can be a good person. You can give a lot of money away. You can do a lot of charitable stuff with your life. But if you don't have this type of supernatural faith accompanied by works, your faith is essentially dead. So how do I get faith? We'll close with Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Get into the word of God. Obey the revealed word of God over and over again. It's simple. If he tells you to do it, just do it. If you know like getting baptized is a, is a command and you know God tells you to do it, just do it. I think we make it out to be really hard sometimes and it's like if God tells you to give, give. If God tells you uh, to, to love your neighbor as yourself, do it. Like be obedient to the revealed word of God that'll bolster your faith and allow you to get to a place where you can obey the unrevealed word of the Lord. Let's pray all over this location. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for how you're stirring in our hearts in this moment. God, I pray that you would draw people close to you right now, God, that you would stir their faith specifically to salvation in this moment. As we're praying all over this location today, as we're praying and you're watching online from Rescue House North and those that are watching online, I want to give you an opportunity to activate your faith and place it in Jesus. Again, remember, it's a dangerous thing to say no to God. And if you feel like throughout this sermon, throughout this message, throughout this day, man, God has been stirring and you know it's time for you to take that faith that God has given you and place it in Jesus. I'm telling you, if you do that, you are forgiven of your sin, past, present, and future. The Bible says to, to be saved, you place your faith in Jesus and you believe that he died on a cross for you. And if you confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart, you will be saved in that moment. And if you want to build this type of faith, if you want to have this supernatural faith, so that your life counts for what matters most, so that you don't get to the end of your life and it's like, man, you wasted it, but you wanna make much of it, then I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer today. I'm gonna help you with the words. You say it after me. And in that moment, you'll, you'll cross from death to life and God will activate this faith inside of you that'll change the game for you. If you're in a circumstance, a situation, you need help, you need healing, you need the Holy Spirit, you need God in your life. A God that is God, Emmanuel, God with you, who will never leave you nor forsake you. He's six closer than a friend. And so if you're lonely today and you need a friend, you need somebody to walk with you through the fire. If you're here today, you know I need a new start. I need a do-over. This is your moment right here. Pray this prayer after me silently in your heart. It's gonna activate your faith. Just say, Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And right now I place my faith in you. I believe that you died for me. And I believe that you rose again on the third day. And I confess that you are my Lord. And right now I, I give you my life. And I'm asking you in return to forgive me of my sin past, present, and future. And I promise to give you my life and to live for you all the days of my life 
the best way I know how. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, man, if you prayed that prayer today, you activated that faith. You crossed from death to life, and this is what we call your one day, your spiritual birthday, that you can have assurance and confidence in that nobody can take it away from you. Sunday, July 16th, this is your day, your moment, that you can have assurance that you'll spend eternity with God in heaven. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for me. I'm just going to, I want to pray for you. So I'm going to count to three. When I say three, I just want you to slip your hand high in the air with no hesitation and leave it there so I can see you and so I can pray for you. Nobody's looking around. Don't bow out of this moment though. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on, lift your hand all over this place, high in the air. It's amazing. Just high in the air, unashamedly. And I'm going to pray for you today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that are making commitments to you today that are placing their faith in you today. God, I pray for a renewed spirit in them. God, give them your Holy Spirit. God, I pray you protect them from the enemy. I pray that they would just uh, get rooted in your church and rooted in your word, God. And I just pray, God, that they walk out differently than when they came in. God, please be with them. We thank you for salvation. And God, I lift them up into your hands right now. God, and I ask that you would reveal to them what their purpose is, what their destiny is, the great calling that you have for them. God, I pray that they would activate their faith and build their faith by being obedient to your word and to what you have asked them and called them to do, God. You knit us together in our mother's womb with a plan and with a purpose. And I pray that for all of Rescue House Church that we would embrace that very purpose. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Come on, can we give Jesus a round of applause for salvation in this place? Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.